Now, talking about climate science, well, the only really good thing to talk about with climate science is not where we've been or where we've come from, it's what we're going to do about it and what it's going to do to us. And I think of that under these headings. I think solutions, security, society and sustainability. And it's very much a societal and a cultural issue. Um, solutions. Uh, there's lots of technological solutions being talked about. Uh, lots of things are being tried. There's a lot of science being done. And a number of governments are putting a lot of money into this area, as, as are a lot of private, uh, private enterprises. Uh, a very nice little book about, that's just been published that really deals with possible solutions on the technological front that would be... A, particularly applicable to Australia, it's from the group at the University of New South Wales, written by Ben McNeil, is this book, The Clean Industrial Revolution. Ben's a young guy and he writes very well and it's very clearly, clearly laid out and is, I think, an extremely good read. This is, a, this is one that's published in North America. There are all sorts of things being talked about, improvements in solar cells, solar furnaces, uh, tide and wave generators, um, uh, geothermal energy, where you tap right deep into the earth and you tap the heat of the earth. Uh, renewable energy, of course, uh, the ultimate would be to get nuclear fusion working. Not nuclear fission, but nuclear fusion, where you essentially replicate on earth the processes that drive the sun. That's, uh, I'm told there's progress in that area. I think it's been a promising area for about 40 years and some of my physicist friends tell me it'll be a promising area for another 40 years, but if we could actually make it work, it would be wonderful because it would be uh, an endless source of renewable energy. There's a very big uh, program in France. Uh, well, we no longer have all those suspicions about the French, do we? So we so. There are a lot of things we can do in the short term and, and we really do need to start doing them. Um, reducing the carbon load. Uh, coal is the biggest issue. Uh, if, if, even if we could just take all coal burning out, it would actually make a big difference to the, to the equation. Uh, gasoline and so forth with the newer cars are uh, much, much, much cleaner than they were. Um, carbon capture and storage, that can be applicable in some places, more difficult in others, because your uh, sites for carbon capture would be very remote from when your power stations are. I don't think, for instance, that in Queensland, South Queensland, where there are a lot of power stations, there's anywhere close by that you could actually do it. I mean, you could liquefy the carbon and then transport it. Uh, there's discussion on the biological front of bioreactors. People are designing algal-type systems which will take up carbon and uh, you'll turn it into, uh, into algae. It's, a, it's, it's kind of complex and, and difficult, but there are pilot plants in operation in various places. Um, we could do some simple things in Australia like exhaust emission checks on cars every year, which aren't done here, but then it would put half the cars off the road and I don't think that it would be very politically popular. We can burn cleaner fuels. Uh, natural gas is a much cleaner fuel. In Delhi, they cleaned the city up dramatically. I don't, you, you've been to these cities and you know how polluted they are, but Delhi is a lot cleaner than it was. And they did that by uh, powering the buses by, uh, by natural gas and forcing the people who run those little uh, 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 sort of um, rick, tr uh, tri rickshaw sort of things uh, to, uh, to use newer equipment. Uh, there's a lot that can be done in that, in that sort of sense. Um, I also think that for those who are young and passionate about this whole climate science issue, it's good to learn some of the science. That it's, uh, it's good to know what you're actually talking about when you're discussing these issues, rather than just operating from an emotional base. Operate from a base of actually knowing uh, what, you're under, what you're talking about. Um, and I think, uh, I think some sort of education in science is really very important, uh, both for those who are going to be dealing with this directly and also for the population in general. Um, methane, we, we burn uh, methane that comes off the uh, sewage works at Werribee, for instance. We have a, uh, uh, a methane-driven uh, electricity activity there, as I understand it. Um, I don't know if anyone of my generation can remember gas producers on cars. I, I, I think uh, 
I think it was poultry manure or something that was used and uh, you had this gas producer on the back and it smelled pretty bad and didn't drive the car very fast. I don't think that's the solution to global warming, at least not a very acceptable one. I repeat that it isn't really a, a left-right issue. I, I, it's, I think, and it's not something that can be done through some sort of rigid government socialist type mechanism. We need governments to put in place the proper regulatory frameworks. We need government to tell industry whether they're going to be subject to carbon tax or, or, or trading schemes or whatever and put those mechanisms in place so that industry knows what it's dealing with. Um, you know, socialist economies, if you look at the old Russian and East German economies, they, they were the most polluting societies on earth. And you can't do it that sort of way. You need to, to unleash the entrepreneurial activity and, and the, the activity that is, leads to new solutions that come out of people's heads and are not centrally controlled. It, it's a very bad mistake, I think, to pick areas that you're going to back. You want to let the whole thing go and see what, what will come out of it, which is what works in science anyway. Uh, the tension in this isn't between capitalist and socialist models. The tension, I think, is between the old, powerful, non-innovative companies that have a vested interest. And ask yourself how much research actually goes on in our, say, large mining and fossil fuel companies. I think you'll find it is very, very little indeed, especially if you compare it with the type of research that goes on in a pharmaceutical company where they plough back at about 20% of their profits into research, and they have to. We, we haven't been accustomed to doing that in areas like energy. Um, and the tension is between those sort of companies and new uh, science-based industrial development, new entrepreneurial development. But of course the big companies have the wealth and the power and they have the ear of the politicians and that is an issue. And so it's, it's going to be an interesting struggle over the next couple of years to see how those settings are actually achieved and, uh, and what's acceptable. Leaving the issue of, 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 uh, of solutions, uh, security and mitigation is, uh, is a really big issue. Uh, food security will be discussed tomorrow. Snow Barlow and Janet McCallman and Tim Reeves are talking about it tomorrow. Uh, that is a big issue, especially with the increase in, in, in desert. Now, we're, we're still not absolutely certain, I guess, what's happening in southern Australia, but it does look as though our, our desert area is essentially going to increase in, in scope and magnitude, which is what's been happening in this kind of belt that's across the world that is subject to, this, uh, to these types of effects. Uh, that brings problems for food production. I mean, we've got these very low rainfalls in what has been the major food production, producing area of the country. Uh, water is a problem and an issue. Not only lack of water, flooding is an issue. And there are health-related issues to do with water as well. If you uh, have too little water, you run the risk of contaminated water for people. On the other hand, if you have flooding, you flood sewage systems and so forth, and you get problems with things like cholera, and your whole public health system go drops down. So you've got that type of issue to deal with. Um, territorial security. If water levels do rise substantially, then the available land masses are going to have to accommodate a lot of people from low-lying areas. I expect that in Australia we will feel a particular responsibility to people from low-lying countries and low-lying islands in the Pacific region. But as Leia said, uh, the issue there is how do people retain their cultural identities if they have to be displaced into some other society. Um, then there will be uh, the, the, the incursions that are not particularly welcome. I mean, what do we do if large ships start to turn up again, uh, out on our shores that are loaded with refugees? It's very hard to see that we could uh, do anything other than take people in. Then the sustainability. There is a whole set of ethical issues now, I think, that come up about sustainability. In human history, we have never really had to think in the long term about what we leave in, se in the sense of natural resources for those coming after us. It's not something that's been a consideration. Our numbers have not been that great. We've not been constrained to think in that sort of way. 
But there is a whole set of philosophical, moral and ethical arguments now that we really have to face. Are we going to consume all the uh, non-renewable energy? Are we going to consume all the metals and, and not leave anything for future generations? I mean, you can say they will be so much more inventive than us, but can we really guarantee that? And I think we have to think about how we recycle, we sustain, and we develop for the long-term future in a way that doesn't destroy or damage the future for our children, our grandchildren, and their children. We, we of course, feel an enormous obligation to our own children and grandchildren, and maybe even those that come after that. But what sort of sense do we have of what obligation we have to, to humanity in the very long-term future? And obviously, we need to think in those terms in, in the very long term. With respect to other themes that are in this, in this uh, meeting, we heard something about uh, we're going to hear what's happening in Asia. I've been in Beijing very recently. I was very impressed with the quality of what was in the newspapers about the climate change issue. It was very positive, uh, very uh, directed towards these are the types of solutions we're going after. If you travel in China, you see solar collectors everywhere. It's clear that the country is very conscious of the issue and is trying to do something about it. Um, I just heard a lecture, if you saw what I wrote in the age this morning from uh, an eminent uh, former president of India where he was talking about their approach to the, en uh, the, the renewable energy situation, uh, also using, uh, going more towards nuclear power, thorium reactors. India has a lot of thorium. Um, what about the literature of climate change? I, I haven't really found very much. I mean... You could think that Dorothea McKellar's I Love a Sunburnt Country is certainly about climate change, but it's about the cycles of drought and so forth that we're all so familiar with. Um, we're going to have the poets talking on Sunday, Chris, Saturday, Chris Wallace Crabb and so forth. We'll be talking, and I don't know whether we're going to hear the great climate change poems that are going to dominate a lot of our thinking over the next few years. One could think of The Grapes of Wrath as a, as a climate change novel. It, it grows out of the Oklahoma Dust Bowl. Um, I don't know about Cormac McCarthy's uh, uh, novels about, whether The Road is about some terrible nuclear war that followed the stresses and strains of climate change. He doesn't tell us. But I guess we will start to see a literature of this uh, once it really starts to happen and, uh, and we see the consequences. Um, maybe visual art forms will be, will be more useful. But again, uh, we've got a great tradition of painting that great Australian dryness with Nolan and Drysdale and all the rest of it. Will we see uh, further uh, issues dealing with perhaps uh, uh, um, rising in water levels and so forth? The final thing I think we need to be clear about is that in all of this, education is enormously important. Education at every level, having people understand the issues and what's happening, having people deal with reality and not live in worlds that are dominated by fantasy, as so much of our economic activity, for instance, would, uh, would, would constrain us to do. I mean, things go better with Coke and all that sort of thing. Uh, it doesn't necessarily. Uh, universities are tremendously important. I think the reason that universities are so important is because these are the institutions in our society where we bring together all sorts of other intellectual activity. And, and we need to be interfacing the universities and reaching out from the universities into industry and business and networking in every way possible. The, every area of university activity has some relevance to this issue and what's going to happen in the future and, and what we need to do to combat it. Um, maybe it's start, time to start a virtual institute for uh, combating dangerous climate change at the University of Melbourne. I think if anyone wants to give a large amount of money to the Vice-Chancellor, he would be very happy to have it. Um, uh, that's what Vice-Chancellors do. They get large amounts of money. They <laughs> I think also we have a particular part to play for various reasons. One of, I think we actually helped delay meaningful action on climate change by supporting Bush. I think if Australia hadn't uh, supported Bush, maybe we would have seen a little bit more activity out of that country. And, of course, if we don't have the United States involved, as we didn't, 
it's, it's, it's very problematic to get anyone else involved. That's changed completely with the election of President Obama. There's a real willingness to change and a real uh, uh, determination to develop new industrial uh, activity uh, that is related to developing clean and green energies. That, if that had come somewhat earlier, and if we hadn't had that crazy war in Iraq, maybe the US and the world economy would be in a hell of a lot better shape than it is now. Um, uh, Guy Pearce wrote about those, those earlier days that are now past and, and, uh, and what we were doing with respect to climate change, or what we were, rather were, what we were not doing. It's kind of a rather sad story. But Australia, I think, does have enormous advantages. We're, we're only 21 million people. We're in a vast land mass. We have very substantial natural resources, particularly resources of uh, things like metals and so forth. Oh, I've lost the whole... I've, I've killed it. Um, <laughs> have you had enough? I mean, I could stop now. <laughs> oh, no, it's come back. Oh, okay, okay. Well... Yeah, we've only got 21 million people. We've got this enormous landmass. I mean, you know that, that scene in the movie Gallipoli where the guy's in the middle of the desert and this old guy's there and these two young boys come up and they're going off to join the army and, and they say, we're going to fight the Germans. And he says, what do you want to do that for? And, he, and they say, well, otherwise they might come and take this place over. And he says, well, they can bloody well have it. And, you know... <laughs> Basically, a lot of Australia, we could turn into one enormous solar collector and we wouldn't lose a hell of a lot, would we? Uh, and we've got tremendous capacity for solar industry in this country, I think, uh, that we really need to exploit. The other, the other alternative is to do what uh, someone was suggesting the Americans are thinking of doing, is painting everything white. You know, with the loss of the Arctic sea ice, we're losing the albedo, which is the reflection of everything back into, into space. And, 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 and as we lose the Arctic ice, uh, you get a lot more heat absorbed. Of course, we're actually getting more ice in the Antarctic. The Antarctic is much colder than the Arctic, and it's not as liable to melting. And in fact, we're actually getting an increase in ice, which is what the IPCC was predicting, because we're getting more moisture in the air because of the warming. And then as a result of that, we're getting more precipitation. But evidently, the whole climate thing there is is enormously complex, but it's, uh, it's very intriguing. We're getting melting around the edges on the West Antarctic ice sheet. So we could paint the whole country white or we could cover it in solar collectors. Either would be entertaining. Um, <laughs> and I think we've got to think that with change comes opportunity. I've just been in Belfast. Belfast used to be the great shipbuilding city. Uh, they don't build ships there anymore. The, the Harlan and Wolfe Company, which was the big uh, shipbuilding company, they've left the enormous gantries. These kind of dominate the town, in fact, in the shipbuilding yard as a kind of an urban sculpture. It's probably a lot cheaper than pulling them down. Uh, of course, the uh, Harlan and Wolfe did build the Titanic. They, um, they said they gave it to the British in good shape and they screwed it up, which I suppose is true. But evidently there's a bit of, bit of doubt about some of the quality of the riveting on it. And... Um, we don't want to be on the Titanic. I don't think that's a very good place to be. And there's a lot of other alternatives. And, and we don't want to just bury our head in the sand and, um, and, and not act while other people are acting on these issues. At the moment, as you look at this, this is a right-wing ostrich. But if you went the other side, it would be a left-wing ostrich. So it's, it's not really... Uh, and it does, it does take up the conservative position head firm. <laughs> I'm sorry, you can see where my politics lie. <laughs> no, what a surprise, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was so sad to see. And of course, some of us could get back to our daytime jobs. I'm, we were focusing a lot on stopping bird flu from reaching Paris. But now we, what about the pig? I mean, we'd forgotten all about her. And uh, so I'll go back to influenza and not bore you anymore with my ruminations on the issue of climate change. And what you need to do is come to these meetings, hear the real experts, and, uh, and you'll get enormous illumination and insight, and you'll be able to argue with them, which is always very important. So thank you.